Welcome to this uh, recording for the SOAS Language for Lockdown series. My name is Dr. Mulaika Hijas. I am the lecturer in Southeast Asian Studies at SOAS, and my area of specialism is Malay manuscripts. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Jawi, um, what it is, why you might be interested in, in learning it, um, and a little bit about its history, and uh, a brief introduction to um, the writing system itself. So obviously this Jawi is not a language, it's rather a script, and it's a script that has been used uh, for, for many hundreds of years for representing the Malay uh, language. Um, so I'm going to share some slides and go through them, and hopefully this is all going to work. Okay. Um, Right, so uh, these are some textbooks that I, I uh, came across. Um, so the, the so Jawi was used, um, it was taught in uh, schools in the Malaysian national curriculum up until the 1980s. And um, as I'll go over the, the longer history of Jawi a little bit um, after this, you know, um, it first is used from around uh, the turn of the 14th century uh, and then uh, is indeed uh, still in use, but not no longer on on the curriculum in uh, on the national curriculum. Um, so some of you may be familiar with the recent controversy about Jawi in Malaysia, having to do with the proposed introduction of um, classes on um, learning. Indeed, not reading or writing Jawi, but uh, calligraphy, as far as I understand it, and a, a lot of opposition to this because Jawi is now perceived as um, uh, intrinsically Islamic, and um, that studying Jawi is perceived um, by some as a an attempt to um, Islamize uh, by stealth or uh, to uh, uh, as a form of da'wah to, to convert uh, non-Muslims to Islam. So what I'm uh, going to outline it in the very brief history of Jawi uh, that I'll go over is that this association between um, Islam and Jawi, although of course it exists, um, is not um, uh, is not intrinsic, right? You can you know, Jawi is a writing system. You can write all kinds of things in it. It was used by people who were Muslim and who were not Muslims as, uh, as well. And if we look back at uh, the, the textbooks from, from the 80s, um, it's quite interesting to see that the perception of Jawi uh, was somewhat different. Um, and that the uh, exclusive association, between, so, so Jawi being only an Islamic thing is something that postdates this, that is really rather recent. Um, so I think it's quite important to acknowledge, or to begin by acknowledging that, um, uh, so Jawi is one system of representing Malay among uh, several others. So obviously now the dominant uh, method of, of representing Malay is, is Rumi, Romanized script. Um, and before Jawi, and in fact at the same time as Jawi, uh, other kinds of scripts were used, um, most so derived from uh, Indic scripts, um, so these are, you know, scripts that indeed are still in use in, in parts of Southeast Asia, uh, Kawi, um, Renchong, Inchong, and the like. So in fact, our oldest uh, examples of, of, of writing uh, from the region are inscriptions in um, Indic uh, scripts as late as, um, so, so the, these are just the inscriptions in forms of Old Malay, fourth uh, century, fifth century, and so on. So we have a really long um, written tradition. Of course, we don't have a lot of surviving material, but it's very important to remember that just because the material doesn't survive, uh, doesn't mean it didn't exist. It did exist. There was a writing tradition. We just don't have it anymore. Um, so these, this is uh, a bit of a indication of um, the different Southeast Asian writing um, forms that ultimately all go back to um, Indic prototypes. And this is um, a map uh, from Cribb's Digital Atlas of Indonesian History, which shows you the locations and the times of um, some of these key um, inscriptions. It's also important to remember that um, 
uh, something can be Islamic and not Jawi. Yeah, so this is um, a, a tombstone from, uh, from North Sumatra, an Aceh, Minyatujo, uh, that dates to about 1380, and it's an Islamic tombstone. Um, but the inscription is in an Indic script. It's a very interesting example because it contains what is, to all intents and purposes, a Sha'ir form in, in Old Malay. Um, so, you know, it can be Islamic without being Jawi. Um, so the oldest Jawi inscription is this uh, Batu Bersurat, uh, in, in discovered in Trunganu. This is not it. This is a massively uh, inflated uh, replica of it at a roundabout in Trunganu, um, reflecting its importance, of course, and its perceived importance. Um, so this is the oldest um, inscription in Jawi that's been found in Southeast Asia around 1300. So the oldest Malay manuscripts, um, manuscript being defined as uh, something written on perishable material, paper or dluang or uh, uh, other kind, you know, various kinds of, of, of paper or indeed vellum. Um, so for, uh, so the oldest um, letters come from around 1510, 1520, uh, the letters from uh, Sultan Abu Hayat of Ternate to the Portuguese. And again, these are the oldest letters that survive. They're not the oldest letters that were ever, you know, these are not the first Malay letters that were ever written. Uh, they survive because they're in the um, Portuguese National Archive, um, which has been running since the 1520s, um, at least. Uh, so this is a, a, an image of, um, of one of those letters from Ternate. Um, the oldest uh, text um, is a copy of the Akkaid of an Nasafi, and it comes uh, from around 1590. Um, and, and so that's the oldest, um, you know, longer document, literal, a religious document in this case. Um, recently, a uh, very interesting discovery uh, by um, Willy Kozak, that um, the, in fact, the oldest surviving Malay manuscript is not an Islamic manuscript and is not a Jawi, but rather is a, a text um, in a uh, Sumatran script, um, and in fact, still owned by uh, a particular lineage in Highland Sumatra. Um, so again, you know, I think it's important to think of the language rather than the script. Um, you know, the history of the language. Um, goes much further back uh, and contains a lot more material than you know the normal account. If we just look at Jawi, then it's a much more restricted history. Okay, um, at this point, I should say a little bit about why you would want to learn Jawi. Well, obviously, um, one of the reasons is uh, as I as we've just looked at, there's this really long history. Um, and many thousands of surviving documents, manuscripts, and the like. Um, particularly, of course, from the later period. Um, so 80 to 90 percent of the surviving Malayan manuscripts come from the 19th century, which is sort of disappointing from a historical point of view, but um, th th that's the way it is for various, uh, for various reasons. Um, and of course, some of those texts, although all the surviving exemplars in the 19th century, the texts themselves, uh, we can reasonably suppose to have been written in earlier centuries. Although, of course, there's a process of change that may, that may or may not be obvious. Um, nevertheless, there's a huge amount of material, and this is the essential primary source material for understanding religious developments, political change, social change, um, everything really, uh, prior to print, right? And print is late in this region. Um, it's also important to point out that there's lots of Jawi printing. So the late 19th century saw a huge explosion in um, lithographic printing. Uh, and so there are lots and lots of texts available um, from that period and into the early and mid 20th century. Lots of Jawi newspapers, magazines, periodicals. Again, a really interesting and, in my view, completely underutilized source for social history. Um, and it, indeed, um, lots of different kinds of histories. But the problem is, all of this is in Jawi. Uh, and 
so you've got to learn Jawi, read it, um, and get at it that way. Um, okay, so I'm here's the alphabet. I am not going to attempt to go through it because that's not going to be possible in 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 this video. Um, but you clearly this is the Arabic alphabet with a few extra letters. So these are the extra letters and. Clearly, again, they represent the sounds that are necessary for Malay and you know, Austronesian languages, but uh, don't occur, in fact, in, in Arabic. So, cha, nga, ta, ga, and nya. Um, conversely, there are a lot of letters that you don't really need for Malay, uh, except in Arabic loan words, where typically a Malay speaker does not pronounce them you know, correctly, uh, or as one would pronounce them in Arabic. So it's a giveaway, dead giveaway for an Arabic loan word if it contains ha or sot and so on. Um, but of course, there are huge numbers of Arabic loan words in Malay and names and so on. Um, okay, so those are the Jawi only letters. Uh, and the problem with Jawi uh or the problem with the Al arabic um alphabet for representing the malay language has to do with the vowels uh in that um the arabic alphabet does not represent so-called short vowels uh so it's usually left you usually have to guess now this is quite st reasonably straightforward in arabic because it has a predictable morphology, right? There are patterns of vowels. Um, so if you're an Arabic speaker, it's quite easy to guess what those would be. Um, now, Malay does not follow that method. Uh, so, uh, so there's a great deal more ambiguity. Um, and, you know, we've got three vowels here, Aleph, Wow, and Yeah. They're representing, as you can see, a large number of sounds. So Aleph could be A, or could be E. Uh. So the little thing is the um, schwa, so it's uh and not eh, yeah, uh, or the Javanese word for it is but, but um, which has schwa in it. Um, so that could, so Aleph can be those two, and then wow and ya can be even more. So it could be u, it could be o, it could be ow at the end of a word, so pisao, for instance, or it could be used as a consonant, w, you know, the beginning of the word or something, yeah. Likewise, ya can be e, can be e, can be i at the beginning of a word, or it could be the consonant ya. So there's a lot of different options, and that's when the that's with a vowel. Now, most of the time, you get no vowel. Um, so it is true that, of course, you can you can represent the vowels with these um, points or the tandabacha in Malay, uh, haraka. Um, so the letter with a line on the top is ba, one beneath is b, and the little kind of mini wow is bu, and uh, sukun or silence uh, is just ba. So this is possible, but the thing is that this is never done except for really beginning readers, even then. Uh, if we look at those uh, textbooks, they don't, they don't do it. Um, the only time, is certainly in the manuscripts that you might see these uh, vowel points indicated, is where the scribe thinks that the reader will have no idea what, what the word is, so particularly for European names. And, you know, I'm always very grateful when I see this because uh, otherwise the European names are absolutely the worst part of reading Jawi manuscripts. So for instance, this um, uh, ra, fa, so ra with the uh, fata, raf, the silencer on the fa, so raf, and then lam with uh, one underneath, li, and then the silence on the scene, so s, rafless, that's raffles. Um, so that's helpful, but you very, very rarely get that. So there, that's the problem with 
shall we? So I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, this is the example that was used in um, M.B. Lewis's um, uh, Introduction to Malay Script, which was a textbook uh, from the 1950s. Um, M.B. Lewis was the lecturer in Malay at SOAS then. Um, it's a really good book, um, particularly for, for you know, non-native speakers. Um, anyway, she has this example of um, the potential ambiguities that can arise from, from um, the lack of vowels, markings, or lack of indication of what the vowel is when you go from, we use an Arabic script for the Malay language. So, okay, these are the letters, lam, mim, ba, uh, nga. So obviously the Roman script is going the other way, yeah? Um, from this, we can generate at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, possibilities, all of which are potentially correct. Um, because this is sort of test your, your vocabulary, but uh, limbang, swampy land, um, lombong, surface cavity, lumbing, tapering to a point, lumbang to be plausible, lumbing of course spear, lumbong swelling to a globe and so on. So th these are the definitions taken from Wilkinson's dictionary. D doesn't even have lumbang, which is perhaps the one modern speakers would come up with first, meaning symbol, emblem. Uh, so, you know, obviously in most cases, it ought to be fairly obvious which one of these you're going for from the context around it. Um, but you know, the, the, there, there is always some room for ambiguity and um, this is what makes reading Jawi a little bit challenging, but also interesting. Okay, here's an example uh, that I um, sometimes use in my classes. So, ka nga, ka nga. So what could that be? Um, yeah, again, uh, native speakers probably gonna come up with kangkong, the vegetable. Um, but you might also come up with um, kang kang to stand with the legs apart, keng keng to stand and then lift up one foot. <laughs> or um, if, as is often the case in the manuscripts, this is not ka but ga. Uh, so often in the manuscripts, they do not include the dot on the cuff. You should just know whether it's ka or ga. They're not going to tell you. So if it's Ga nga, ga nga, then it could be gong gong to bark or a whole load of other things. Um, I recently came across this or, uh, sometime during Kung Kung Gate, if uh, anybody remembers that in Malaysia, a scandal involving the former uh, prime minister. Um, somebody produced this meme which I thought was very useful for this. So it could be a Kong Kong, which is a slow loris. And it's entirely different from Kong Kong. Um, so, and when you are trying to read it, you will have to figure out whether it is Kong Kong or Kong Kong. Um, okay, so that's the whistle stop tour of a um, little bit about the history of Jawi, a little bit about um, why you might want to learn it, and um, some features of, of the alphabet and the main problem um, of reading Jawi, which is. Um, the vowels. Now, actually, I'm going to um, say a couple more words about the other things that are a bit tricky about Jawi. Um, so the vowels, as I've, as I've mentioned, um, non-standard spelling. So uh, people who have learned Jawi in school or religious school or uh, are always quite irritated that the manuscripts have um, are not spelled correctly. Um, and there's a huge amount of variation of spelling. So you might have the same word spelled about three or four different ways on, on the same page. Um, well, this is quite normal, not just for Jawi, but for any other pre-print um, script or representation of the language. Of course, there's no, there's no standardization. There's a huge amount of regional variation. There's no um, Dewan Bahasa to tell you what is what. Um, so you just have to accept um, non-standard spelling. Also, obviously, there's no capitalization and there's no punctuation. Uh, so words, sentences just keep running. 
um, and there are certain words that indicate a stop, um, which you, you would get used to, but it, you know, the, the layout of the text is, it doesn't have all these visual markers that we as readers of print um, are accustomed to. So that's something to get used to. And then of course, handwriting, just getting used to um, somebody else's handwriting, even in, you know, the script that you're most familiar with, say the Roman script is, is uh, a considerable undertaking. Um, so I'm going to end with uh, just um, mentioning some of the resources that are online if anybody um, wants to uh, do more Jawi, which I hope you do. Um, so I mentioned already Wilkinson's Dictionary. This is a 1909 dictionary, very useful for literary texts uh, of the 19th century. Um, and it's available in two different formats online, one on C-Lang where you just put in the word in Rumi and it spits out the definition, or you can look at the full text and page through it, which how, the reason that that's on um, archive.org and the reason that that's useful is that it has the Jawi in it. So if you, so sort of two different ways of looking things up depending on what you're starting from. Um, so perhaps uh, some of you may be aware of the Malay Concordance Project, which is a really amazing resource um, where you can search for the occurrence of uh, words in particular texts, and then you can try to figure out, you know, so you think it might be Konkang, but is that possible? Did people really use that word in, you know, these kinds of texts? Uh, did they talk about slow loris? Uh, so you can look it up there. Um, I also highly recommend uh, Dr. Gallup's um, Introduction to the Jawi Sourcebook, which you can find on her um, academia.edu page, along with many of her really, really amazing publications. Um, and so this introduction really just gives a, a, a general uh, overview um, of, of Jawi, something uh, uh, similar to what I've tried to give here. And the sourcebook itself has um, examples of Jawi script from different places in different times. And the, so it's got a, an image and then some um, transcription of it. And it's, it, it's kind of a good way to practice or at least familiarize yourself with the variety of hands um, that, are, uh, that we might come across. Um, so there's also the Jawi transcription project, which is something that I run uh, and you can certainly have a look at that and have a go at transcribing uh, a literary text. Um, I will talk about that more in, in a forthcoming video. And then just the bibliographic reference for, uh, for Lewis's Handbook of Malay Script, which again, I highly recommend and sometimes you can buy on, uh, from secondhand. Um, so that's it from me for this time. And I hope you enjoyed it and I will be making and I hope to see you again for the next video.